So I was a long time vegetarian. I think I did I did the classic journey into veganism. I um, I was pescatarian and then I was vegetarian. Um, and then it was over a conversation with um, with a friend of mine. I think like one Christmas time we were out at a gig. There was vegan food both vegetarian for a really long time and like felt very strongly about animal rights. I was just like, why do we still eat cheese and things? Like this seems so hypocritical. And I kind of, I'd kind of known it was hypocritical for a while, but I was part of the, oh, I could never give up cheese club. Um, and I lived in France for quite a long time. And my like go-to was like a block of Comte and a baguette. And I, I was like, I can't give this up. There'll be no alternative. It's just too good. And you, you tell yourself, oh, it's like, I'm not killing the animal. But then you look more into it and you get more and more kind of um, obsessed with what you're doing. And like, it just came to me, like, if I'm not eating meat, then then why am I eating animal products as well? Like this became exactly the same. Um, so I was with a friend one Christmas and we were eating some vegan food, having a glass of wine. And we were like, let's do Veganuary um, in, in January. And then let's see kind of like how things go from there. And so we both started doing it, I think both fully expecting that we wouldn't go back anyway. Um, and what really astounded me was my partner who was vegetarian with me as well, but he'd like, he'd eaten meat on and off, like through the time we'd been going out. I uh, wasn't like super strictly vegetarian. Um, he made the change as well at the same time as me. And we've both been vegan now for about six years. Um, yeah, never gone back, but it was really that classic, like cut out one thing, one thing, one thing. And this whole like narrative about cheese that I had I think the first time I went back to France I was like huh, what will I eat now and then I don't know it's like anything isn't it it's like you stop a habit and then suddenly you, that's just not what you do anymore you discover there's there's just other things like I don't even think about cheese anymore I don't even buy vegan cheeses to be honest like I just yeah that that kind of habit is is gone so yeah, that was kind of it, really. Nothing too like dramatic, or <laughs> just really realised that if I was cutting out meat, then why was I? Mm. Why was I eating like the other products as well? Yeah. When you when you transitioned over, and obviously you'd been vegetarian for a long time, so you you you'd, you'd learned the ways. You you were set in the in the kind of vegetarian lifestyle, and I'm kind of intrigued because if you then cut out dairy i think one of the things that i you know i i found surprising i guess was the kind of hidden dairy products the the amount that just exist in places that they don't seem to have any place like belonging randomly in a packet of crisps or something yeah just yeah. milk powder <laughs> appears to be like what else should we put in this let's just pop some milk powder in it <laughs> i don't know why let's just do it so like, oh, there must be a i don't know an excess of milk powder somewhere but it's in everything. Did did that kind of have a have a bit of an, an effect? Were you just expecting to give up the cheese and the baguette? <laughs> Was it a bit of a surprise? I think it's something that yeah, you 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 think about like the actual dairy product. You th you think okay, well I can't eat butter and I can't eat cheese, and then you start to think, huh, well I can't eat cake and I can't have this and I have to change. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, I think like I saw a meme the other day of somebody with like like laser eyes looking at a supermarket label and this was like the first month of being vegan like looking for milk powder because it's true it's in it's in so many random things that it absolutely doesn't need to be there. Um yeah, and it it made me think about you know the whole conversation about like ultra processed foods and things recently. Just like there's so many things in what you eat that I I think being vegan sort of starts to make you think more about like what, what you're eating and what's actually in it. Because it's true. Like, I don't know how many thousands of people throw a packet of crisps in the shopping thinking they're dairy free. And then there's a whole huge amount of milk powder in them. Um, yeah, there's so many random products like that. So it's like, I think it's a learning at first, but then after a few months, it's like second nature. Um, and I'm I'm like a woman on a mission as well. Like my boyfriend laughs at me because I'm like I know exactly what might have milk powder, what might not have milk, <laughs> what's accidentally vegan, what's marked. So I'm um, yeah, like I'm I'm really on it now. And nothing is more exciting than when you go to like a foreign supermarket or something and realize like they have an accidentally vegan biscuit or something that you. Don't <laughs> <have it on. laughs> Talking of you know going back to other countries, how did you find going back to France? Because I've heard various 
stories from folks about challenges they've had in in certain parts of France and other part, parts being easier. What was your experience like there? In France, it, it is getting better, but I do think it's one of the countries that's one of the hardest still mm. to find vegan. Like, it's not that it doesn't exist. There's really good vegan places in France now. What's like particularly Paris is quite good. Um, I spent quite a lot of time in Marseille during lockdown and they've got some really good options. But it, I find in France, you really have to, if you want to go and eat out, you have to really plan where you're going that it's going to have vegan options because it's not obvious or it's not going to be on every menu. Not everywhere is going to have like oat milk or something for your coffee. So I think I find myself when I'm like, over visiting or working in Paris, I need to like look up first of all, right, where am I going to eat where it has like vegan alternatives and things. It's it's gotten better, I think, in the last couple of years, but it's it's still, I think France is probably one of the more challenging places. Probably one of the only places where I've gone in and like asked if I can have oat milk in something and they're just like, no, no, you may not. <laughs> um, Spain has actually gotten really good which took me by surprise but like Barcelona and Madrid have amazing vegan food now which I never thought like when I when I was younger I studied in Spain and I remember asking for a vegetarian salad and it came and it was like full of chicken and they were just like yeah of course chicken um but yeah they have so many good vegan options now I think like our, one of our favorite places to go is Barcelona now, just for the just for the food because there's so many vegan spots. But France is, yeah, you can find it. They've got a really good um, a really good chain of vegan bakeries there now, like a patisserie called Landa Monkeys, which is my like absolute favorite. When I go, colleagues are like, "Did you plan the hotel just to be next to the vegan patisserie?" <laughs> Which yes, I did. Um, yeah, and it's amazing. Like you cannot, you cannot tell the difference. Like the best looking cakes and baguettes and things like that, all vegan. Um, which seems to be really popular as well. I always think that's interesting. It's not a very vegan country, but then they have this vegan chain of um, of patisserie and cakes and things. Um, it's not really branded that much as being vegan. Like you, what you might not tell as you go by. So I think it just has like general clientele that maybe don't even realize it's like plant-based and because it's good it just does really well but um yeah I always find that kind of interesting when you go somewhere that's not super vegan friendly but then they'll have a vegan thing and it just does incredibly well so you're like maybe there is demand for it here it just hasn't been met but then kind of interesting that they're not advertising it what's your kind of views on that because there's you know, in the in the sort of certainly in the the vegan business world, which I kind of have like one foot in, there's um there's a constant debate and a push and a pull about whether you should use the word vegan, whether it's off putting, um just out of interest because you talk about that that patisserie chain and this this kind of non vegan clientele. It, it, interesting to get your take. Yeah, I think it's funny. I don't I don't know why. You, like I, I, it drives me mad that the word vegan is off putting for people like why is that a bad thing I don't know um like I think they go by plant-based or something this this one in France or like vegetal so it's like not super obvious it's not the word vegan I don't know I mean my like my thought process is like wouldn't it just be a lot easier if like the standard for a lot of places was vegan and then you could add to it or something um but it's yeah, it's. I, I don't know why it's so off-putting for people, but it, it seems to be a word that I don't know people associate with it being they're going to be disgusting, or it's going to be dry, or it's going to be tasteless, or something. It's just, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just an education thing, isn't it? It's also like when people associate the word vegan with being super healthy as well. I think that's also really funny. I saw an article the other day where they were like, oh, you know, we bought this vegan meat and it's supposed to be, it's vegan. Why is it not healthy? It doesn't say it's healthy, it's, it's vegan. Like those are two different things. Um, yeah, I don't know why it's so off-putting. Like I wish more places would just use the word and then maybe people would actually realise that you can find really good tasty food that is vegan. You can use lots of brands that are just as good that are vegan. I think maybe by not using it, we're like never going to get to that point. Yeah. Um, and the whole plant-based thing, I find like a little bit controversial as well because I hear a lot of people say that they're plant-based. 
and then not like fully vegan. I feel like I find that like very misleading as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I, I find a plant based when I see it in, even in, if I see it on a restaurant menu, um, there's a there's just more of a skepticism. Yeah. To me, just because I've been, you know, I've not personally been burnt, but heard stories uh, where where folks have their you know the definition of plant based in that particular restaurant is is yeah. not what we would might call what we would call vegan. Yeah, but, I have found that in places where it's it's been like I was plant based, but with egg or like I think yeah mm. you have to be really careful with it because like you say not everybody's definition of plant based is is the same. I feel like if you use the word vegan, there's at least an understanding, or there should at least be an understanding of, you know, that's quite a deliberate choice of word. Like I, I would hope yeah. that you knew what it meant, sort of, sort of thing. It's, it's funny yeah. that you mentioned that as well um, about um, people thinking veganism is kind of healthy, or that vegan food, I should say, not veganism, but vegan food uh, is healthy. Um, because I, I always find that like people kind of shape shift depending on what your ar- argument you're in. I'm thinking about like friends and family I've got who are non vegan. So uh, it's either like everything you eat is boring salad. Uh, I, I can <laughs> eat like that, or everything you eat is ultra processed. Depending on what yeah. I happen to be eating at that given moment. Yeah. The a- ultra processed thing dri- like drives me insane. <laughs> like, actually, I don't go home and eat a vegan burger every day. Like I, <laughs> I, I eat very well, but I could also choose not to. Like that's fine. That's not actually what veganism is at all. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. It's really. It's really funny. People's. Yeah. People's arguments change. We went to. Um, so I often have to, like I kind of get on my soapbox about veganism, and my my partner kind of like tells me to get down. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I remember we went into a, a bakery in in Brighton a little while ago, and Brighton being Brighton, a lot of stuff is vegan, right? So yeah. I was like, you know, is anything here vegan? And this one, <laughs> her choice of words really annoyed me because she said, "No, no, no, we use real ingredients here." Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Have you ever encountered a coconut or no, not real food? Um, how did that yeah. go? What was how did that conversation play out? I'm fascinated to hear what happened. <laughs> My partner could see me like about. <laughs> oh, okay, you, were you held back? <laughs> yeah, I had to hold, hold back and just leave. Him, so, okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, because he was like, I already know where you're going with this. Um, <laughs> you need to not get into an argument. Just leave it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah one of those no i totally get that the word normal triggers me when uh with milk normal milk yeah Yeah. when would you like normal milk or if i say oh, i'll have oat milk and then i'm with somebody else and then they'll say oh would you like oat milk or would you like the normal milk to the other person because they'd like are you look kind of like the same as this guy or like do you want the normal <laughs> yeah, stuff you normal. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that 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 troubles me i know most people's intention is not you know they, they just like yeah. that's the de- they mean default but um it's still the use of the word normal and i have sometimes i i, I have to say i have sometimes said there's nothing normal about drinking a cow's <laughs> milk <laughs> Um, it's how far into that argument you want to get while you're ordering a coffee that's yeah. what you have to well this is it it's just if i'm caught on a particularly yeah, yeah. <laughs> a particularly angry day then you know sometimes but i try not to because it's you know it's obviously not not the i, and I don't think that's the intention most <laughs> most of no, the time I mean, I, <laughs> lady's intention probably wasn't to tell me the why it wasn't real food either. <laughs> just like certain words trigger you yeah know? yeah like, what yeah. do you mean with real ingredients? I eat real ingredients. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. How would you kind of describe your your veganism in terms of diet? I'm talking here, not the wider thing. I'm always um, always kind of keen to to point that <laughs> out, yeah. just in case sort of folks jump on. I know vegans not just about food. Where you know it's a whole whole culture lifestyle. But in terms of how would you describe like your your kind of choices has it made you uh would you say overall healthier about the same where where would you say you kind of landed in your vegan journey i think i've always eaten fairly healthy ish i'm very much like 
uh, well, a, a lot of the food that I eat is like I've always just really loved vegetables anyway. It's like mm. the ongoing joke between me and like friends and family that I absolutely love Brussels sprouts uh, since I was a child. Like, They're great. Love Brussels sprouts and broccoli. Mm. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've never really like eaten terribly. Um, never really been into like fast food or anything. Uh, like I wasn't brought up with anything like that either. Although like my parents eat meat, we would never like. I think I think I hadn't been to like a McDonald's or anything until I was maybe like I don't know fifteen, and I was at a friend's party, and I was super confused <laughs> by what was happening. <laughs> um, so we've always like cooked at home and eaten quite healthily, but I think it made me like think a lot more about what I'm eating, like it just in terms of um, like the macros and things. And I'm not super strict with counting things, but like just making sure that there's protein in what I'm eating or that I'm having enough like greens with something. Um, yeah, I think it it's made me think more about like the balance of what's on the plate than um, just, yeah, putting something together. But generally I think, yeah, I think it was funny when we went, when I went vegan, I also like, it also coincided with me stopping drinking alcohol for a while. So I think at the point I was like, wow, I feel really amazing since I've been vegan. And I was like, why is it I stop drinking wine? I'm not entirely <laughs> sure like, which one. I probably should have done one or the other to check. But um, yeah, I think like in terms of what we eat, like we, we do, we're kind of like the stereotype. We eat a lot of salads, we eat a lot of tofu, we eat a lot of tempeh, <laughs> like all this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's just what I enjoy really. Um, at the same time, like I do a lot of running and sport and stuff. And so I also kind of go with like, I just eat what I feel like a lot of the time as well. And whether that's healthy or not super healthy, I just try and like strike the balance with it a bit. When you say you, you do a bit of running, I, I, I think that might be one of the biggest understatements, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that I've ever heard just from following you online. <laughs> um, so, and I want to get into that and, um, and certainly where it sort of intersects with, with veganism, you know, it might be more of a dietary thing. It might, it might not be, I don't know, but um, where, where did that start? Where did the kind of love of running come from? Yeah. So um, I, it's one of those things. It's like, I could just start running or I could let it consume my entire life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it's a weird story. Actually. I was like, never a sporty kid or anything. Um, I didn't really do much sport at all in like most of my teens, early twenties. Um, and when I met my boyfriend who, um, or I still live with now, we first, when we first moved in together, we, we moved into a building that had like a gym um which was amazing and I I could not run like not for a bus like I just hated running like the thought of it was so stupid to me I think once or twice during uni I'd gone oh, I'll go. like you know you hear those people going I'm gonna go for a run oh, that sounds quite nice maybe I will too and then you very quickly regret it as you get to like the corner of the street like that was that was me with running um and then I was like watching people on treadmills and things in the gym. I was like, no, I want to be able to do that. Like, I want to be able to at least run for, and I'm not even joking. I, my goal was like, I want to be able to run for 10 minutes without stopping. Um, and so I managed to do that on tread. The, having the treadmill was nice as well. Cause I think like when you start doing a sport, if you go outside, like you feel like you're going to be judged by like the real runners of the world, which you now know is stupid when you run yourself, but like, it's just something that's in your head that like, I can't, I can't go running and please clothes that I'm wearing or people might see me stop and think I'm not, you know, a proper runner. So I started doing it on the treadmill and then I managed to get to about, um, like ramp up to about 5k, um, which I was super happy with at the time, like really slowly getting to five kilometers. And then, um, I'm, I'm just very competitive and I, le I like, I need to have a goal. And so as soon as I could run 5k, I said, right, okay, I'm going to sign up for a half marathon and I'm going to do it for charity and that'll make me train for it. Um, so I signed up to do the Royal Parks in London, which was the first race that I did. Um, I, at the time, I thought it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Like I, my friend has a picture of me at eight miles and I look like I'm about to die. Uh, <laughs> it was so hard. And um, I don't know, I just like got the bug from there really, but it was... Yeah, I think probably like eight years ago now when I started. Um, 
yeah, did 5K, then was like, right, do that half marathon. Um, once I did that, I decided that I wanted to try a trail run. So like a few months later, I, I trained up and uh, not a few months, but like nine months later, I trained for um, this 50K run that was happening on the Isle of Wight. Um, so I just kind of, I don't know, just really got into it. And I think the more I did it, the more it became like not exercise anymore, but more of just a thing I enjoy doing. Um, so just started doing more and more kind of weird races, longer races. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it came out of nothing really just a just a sort of one day in the gym going, why can't I run for 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> so you went half marathon to 50 K. Yeah, that was stupid. Don't like, if, yeah, don't do that. That's not <laughs> good. <laughs> Cause I mean, I, I, I do a bit of running and um i've done a, like a london marathon and lots of halves and things like that but um like probably most people who've dabbled in this i went you know lots of halves once i'd got to that point and that took a fair while and i totally relate to the kind of you know i can't run half a mile down the street mm. oh, i can do a mile i can do maybe i could do two maybe i could do five you know that sort of thing yeah yeah but once I got to the marathon, I was like, that almost killed me. I think that'll do. <laughs> I think I'm happy with the 10K now and then. I'm happy with the 5K on the weekend. That'll do. If I really want to, maybe a charity half marathon. But that, that'll do. The, <laughs> the, the half to I 50. I think a lot, though. And I don't, I don't know... I don't know why, but like every so often I'll, like, I think when I was running 50K, I was like, that's enough. 100K seems a bit excessive. And then I started doing 100Ks. It's like, okay, I, like, I can do this. And very recently I was like, I'm never going to run 100 miles. That just doesn't sound fun. Like, why would I do that? Um, and now I've done two. And I was saying to my friend the other day, do you reckon I could run 200 miles? So I, I think it's just like an obsessive personality. Or something. Right. <laughs> So you've done, so is that the longest distance you've done so far? Yeah, in one go, 100 miles is the longest, yeah. I've done a couple of, like, um, multi-stage races mm -hmm. where um, I did one in Jordan a few years ago, so it was about 250 kilometres, but over the space of, like, a couple of days. Um, wow. But, yeah, 100 miles is the most, like, straight through, yeah. Can you can you talk us through your experience doing that, the Jordan multi-stage? Like, two, was it 250k? Yeah, so it's across five days. I mean, it's amazing. Um, I can't remember why I signed up to it. Like, it <laughs> there's wasn't a, any profound. There's a theme. There's a theme here. There's a theme. Like, nothing I do is ever particularly <laughs> profound or for an amazing reason other than just to see if I can and because I think it'll be a good experience. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it was... So it's five days um, and you go up to the Wadi Rum, which is like this amazing expansive desert where they film, they film a lot of films there that are supposed to be on Mars and it's like this kind of um, scenery. It really looks like you're on another planet um, and you camp every day and they move the camp. So when you end at that spot and you go from that spot again in the morning, it was my first experience of um, like just things like, you know, like eating dehydrated food and things between between running and yeah sleeping in an open tent with other people um it was absolutely amazing so I think like yeah you do on average about like 50k a day for five days some days slightly shorter some days slightly longer um but it's extremely hot <laughs> yeah and um I don't think like anything can prepare you for like the desert when it like there's no I, I, this sounds stupid of course we all know this but there's no shade and so when you're running for hours and hours every day and it gets really intense I think the thing that's like so overwhelming with the desert is there's just nowhere to get any kind of relief you're just in the heat the whole day um but yeah I mean it was it was interesting like to see I just wanted to see if I could do it and I wasn't sure I could um I had a massive breakdown on the middle day like I'm I'm not ashamed to say I had a little cry <laughs> just like I'm just too hot this is too far I'm too tired um so I had a bit of a meltdown that the third day was the longest day I think I'd been running for about 50 kilometers I thought it was 60 something k and it actually ended up I think the 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 day was actually about 70, 75 kilometers in total. So it was a bit longer than I'd anticipated. 
Um, and I think at about the 50k mark, I just had like a bit of a, a tantrum, uh, <laughs> a cry, a shout. <laughs> and then, um, I don't know, like 10 minutes of tantrum cleared all that out. And I was like, okay, right, we can finish this. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I haven't done many multi-stages, but that one was pretty amazing. Like, it's not often that you get to do things like that. Um and you meet some really interesting people as well. Like I met um, a guy who was running there who became um, a friend. I've seen him at other races and he was in recovery from what was supposedly like terminal prostate cancer. And he'd been given like two years to live. Um, and I think he was five years past that at the time he did this race. And he keeps on doing these incredible races in all different parts of the world um, and he was kind of telling me his story as we were running um, part of the the desert. I'm like, it's true. Like, how often do you get to run with these kind of people in the middle of the desert, like sleeping out in the evening? Like, it was, uh, yeah, it's a cool experience, but it's it's also very testing on your body. <laughs> is is there not a very real threat that you could die doing that sort of thing? Is that not that's quite a hardcore event, right? <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, you have support in in these things. Yeah. Like there are people around, you have like an emergency button on your tracker oh, okay. and things. So I think like the, the risk of the risk of dying is probably quite low in that one. But um, yeah, although there, there are points where you get kind of like vultures circling you because they're like, why is this Welsh woman out in the middle of the desert? She's surely going to uh, yeah, so you start to see bird circle and things, which is uh, which is always really funny. But um, no, I think like yeah, you're you're quite well looked after. Obviously, like people are expecting you back at camp. Uh, there's water and stuff like being provided every so often, so you're. Uh, I think I'm yeah, far too anxious. Far too anxious to go anywhere near that. I'd, <laughs> I'd be terrified. <laughs> so, you know, like it, it kind of teaches you. Like I think it's like a good learning moment, stuff like that, because obviously, like. We won't go into the bathroom situation and stuff either on here, but like it's it's so like I don't know alien to what what I'm used to anyway, and especially like coming from doing road marathons and things like that. I'd done a bit of trail, but I was like, wow, this will be a really cool experience. And then the reality when you get there of like trying to rehydrate your food, like the bathroom situation, everything is so bizarre. But it's I mean, yeah, you learn a lot of th- I think about yourself when you're when you're running in 40 something mm. degree heat yeah <laughs> does doing something like that make you know put things like you know the, the london marathon as an example into kind of a a different context for you do, do you sort of now view that as a bit of a fun run i don't know like i think everything i think it's a different sport this is what i was saying right. like with okay. the utmb races and things like it I, I see it as a different sport. Like if I'm running, like a marathon is still really hard. Like, like don't get me wrong, I'm still dying at the end of a marathon <laughs> because I think you, you're you pushing yourself for more speeds on roads. Um, it's less about, like when you do something like 100 miles or desert or something, I, I think I enjoy it because it's like a science to it. It's like, um, okay, what do I need to eat and when? When do I need to drink? Do I need to take salt? Do I, like there's a lot more to kind of to think about and it's more like how you can keep your body in good enough condition to keep going. Whereas I think something like London Marathon is more like how fast can I, like how fast can I push myself? How quickly can I finish? Which is still super hard just in a, a different a different way. I'm not the best marathon runner in the world. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to sit down and say marathons are easy because I'm, yeah, I'm not the the best at them, but like, I think it's just a, a completely different kind of kind of sport. Yeah. That makes sense when you put it like that. How about the, the sort of the, the vegan food when you're doing that kind of event, when you're doing a, a long distance event and, you know, nutrition becomes a real factor, I'd imagine, the longer distances you go multi-stage overnight like you say dehydrated food all this kind of thing what's the kind of availability like of vegan diets how how supported are they i guess in that world yeah i mean there's a lot of vegan ultra runners and trail runners it seems to to be um yeah i think there's more and more all the time um, so it is it is getting much better that there's it depends on the organizer of the race and where it's being held 
there's a lot in the UK that do a really, really good job. Um, like I did 100 miles with the Centurion race in the North Downs, I think it was last year. Um, and they mark out the things are vegan. So when you're coming in absolutely knackered, you can see that like what's in the sandwich or whatever you're grabbing. Um, I think like when you're, let's go back to France. <laughs> I find France, like they have some amazing trail races, but it's a lot less catered to if you're vegan. Um, I always find it interesting what people crave doing those as well. Cause I think um, at the like, latest race I was, I was doing the TDS in Chamonix they had some vegan things, not a lot to choose from. So you need to make sure you're carrying enough stuff yourself to cover you. You get there and you're like, who's eating charcuterie halfway through a hundred mile race? (laughs) (laughs) At what point does that become? But I guess people are eating it. Um, Yeah. And I mean, some of the races that I've done, like in sort of Slovenia and more Eastern Europe, I find you can, you can usually find something. It's just, not super well catered to so you may you maybe have one thing you can eat or but there's always fruit and stuff you know there's always like some banana or something I just make sure that I have um my vegan snacks like in my race bag or a drop bag or something just in case have you got some go-to's um yeah it's changed a little bit recently because I had a a very bad uh, spate of vomiting on a race in Slovenia earlier this year so I've had to mix up what I take (laughs) um yeah there's these kind of like chia bars that I really love whilst I'm running just like if it's a really long race I like to have some actual food to chew I find that like the gels and things are fine to a point but then they start to really turn your stomach if you're just putting like sugary gels in for a while um so that yeah um I think it might have been centurion races where I discovered a love of um potatoes with salt that was just okay. <laughs> like the gods had put that on the table for me. Um, little pots of like boiled potatoes with salt that goes down a treat, sweet potatoes, stuff like that. But my absolute go to, um, and there were a few British people at the race in Chamonix who I told about this, and they were like, oh, You did not. Like, that sounds so good. I, um, I've discovered that if I make a Marmite sandwich, for my midway like 50 mile drop bag that I I look forward to that so much because everything else you take in is so sweet and I'm like oh my god I'm gonna have like a savory sandwich halfway through it really perks you up so I was like lying on the floor in an aid station (laughs) eating a Marmite sandwich um yeah spot the Brits in the middle of (laughs) But it's, yeah, just something like super salty like that just kind of really, yeah, keeps me going. So th- that raises an interesting point. You know, having, uh, I'm completely naive to this. Like I say, done one marathon, that one and done, that'll do, and halves and stuff where you're not you're not having to worry so much about this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you're not having to worry about nutrition and so on. And, and to some extent, even at those distances, I found, you know, once you got past... 10k I always used to think it was the rest of it was psychology you know the rest of its mindset it's like your body once it can do 10k can probably do the rest is that how does that play out the in these big distances is it is it all mindset is it all psychology I don't think it's all but I think it's a lot of it yeah um like I'm comparing this year so I I had two big races I wanted to do this year one was 100 miles in Slovenia um and the other one was the TDS which is like just under 100 miles around uh, Mont Blanc and my head was in like completely different place for both of them just before Slovenia I think like so many things that like so many stupid things happened so I ended up postponing my flight and flying out like the night before the race and then traveling quite a long way. I think, yeah, this, this sounds so stupid. <laughs> my, my cat hurt his leg and had to go to the vet and they had to have stitches and things. And so I was like, right, I, I can't, like, I can't go right now. So I, I pushed it. Then we had like a leak in the house and came through the ceiling. So we're dealing with that and stuff. So like all the lead up to that race, like, and then work was really busy. And I just think I, yeah, I got there, but like, my head was somewhere else um then my like fueling went a bit wrong on it I took like too many gels too early so I'd be sick and I think I just started to like I don't know what's the word like catastrophize what was happening 
and you start to go, I could just stop. Like, why am I doing this? I could, whereas I think in, um, yeah, like the, the UTMB races that just came around. Yeah. It was really, really hard. And there were bits where you do want to stop and just lie down and not get up again. <laughs> but I think I was in a really good like mental space, also perfect conditions as well. Um, so like you're in the most beautiful scenery when you're running around there as well, which helps. Um, but yeah, I just, I think your, yeah, your mentality is, is a lot to do with it. If you can stop yourself from going into this woe is me kind of situation, you're, um, yeah, you're, you're going to get through it. It's, um, yeah, but it's a very hard one to manage sometimes. You can't, like, it's, I think it's much more difficult to, like, control what your head's doing than what your legs are doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, those two, like, this year I thought was really interesting. Like, I had the worst time, right? <laughs> and Slovenia's beautiful and I've run it before. Um, and I was, like, I'm having the worst time. Like, I feel ill. I've had all the stress leading up to it. The conditions were not great. Like it was muddy, there was snow. And I was like, okay, I could just stop. <laughs> um, and things just got worse and worse and worse in that race until I, I, I couldn't stop throwing up. It was awful. But um, yeah. And then I think I would say the one in Chamonix was was harder technically, but I was just in a much better like frame of mind. So like stopping wasn't really an option. Would you describe it as the process of actually running those kind of distances is it is it enjoyable to you at this point or or is it about or is it more about you wanting to overcome it and the enjoyment comes at the end i think it's both there there are bits it, it's one of those things as well where i do think when you finish you block out a lot of what was bad <laughs> so um i think there were some points during that last race where i was like I'm never running this again. And then I finished. I was like, that was the most amazing run. And I keep going on about it to people. But um, no, I think I do enjoy it in the moment as well. Like it is fun. It's a good experience. You, yeah. I, yeah, it's hard to say. It's, it's like a love-hate kind of thing. Like you are in a lot of pain, obviously. And you, I kept joking in this last race. It was like, this is such a stupid thing to do to your body. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah I think no I do enjoy it or I wouldn't or I wouldn't do it I think there there is enjoyment through it but you go through some moments where you have to re-pick yourself up um but then I think overcoming it kind of and finishing really um yeah then you start to go into overdrive you start to forget some of the bad moments of it and yeah, like last week I was on a huge come down from uh, from the mountains. It's like I haven't got any more races planned for this year and now I have to find something because I'm just in this spiral of like not knowing what to do with myself. You're talking of that, you know, but obviously you, you do a lot of races. Like you said, there's nothing planned necessarily for, for, for the rest of this year. How, how do you go about your training? Is it kind of you're, you're always ready or are you constantly kind of in a, taper build taper build kind of process um i i don't train with the best plan to be honest i think like i love running i really really like going out for a run um and so and i love trails and things and long runs so i think i'm i'm always on like a certain base fitness just because i run most days um but then when i'm like gearing up to a race like that for maybe like 10 weeks 12 weeks ahead of that I'll start to actually follow more of a plan um, and increase the mileage what I'm doing I'll start to add more like strength training into it um, yeah and then start to switch to doing like two or three workouts some days a couple of weeks before so I kind of like start to ramp it up but I'm always like a, a certain base fitness just because I like running and I'm always out running anyway but then the actual training of telling yourself, right, I need to do this hill session. I, like, I think it becomes much more regimented in the couple of weeks leading up to it. Yeah. So it takes a minute to get from standard, like going out for 20 K or something on a Saturday to being ready to run a like, hundred miles in the mountains. So you have to, yeah. Is there a race that you have got on a, on your bucket list? Like, is there a marathon de Sable that you'd love like to do that kind of vibe or is there something else? There's quite a few, um, cause I've done, I've done quite a lot, but like, there's still loads to do. Um, 
I'd really like to do one of the big American races in the next year or two if I can get a place. So like I'd love to do something like Leadville um, or like Western States, which is super hard to get into or something like that. Just because I've, I've never run in the US and they have like these amazing like old school, super famous races like this um, that I'd really love to do because I've only really done sort of European or like some desert things as well, but mainly like mainly running in Europe. Um, so I just love to see kind of like what the culture is around it as well. The other one I'd really like to do is the Mount Fuji in Japan. Um, because there's a trail race that goes around, I think, I think they have different distances. I think it's like a hundred miles, hundred K, 50 K or something like this. Um, and I, I didn't know, but like Japan has this huge trail running culture. They're really, really into it. And so I like, I would just love to see also just kind of want to see what the food is like at the stations during that race <laughs> I bet that's amazing <laughs> you know you mentioned that there's quite a, a culture of vegans in ultra marathon running that that you're that you kind of end up running races with and so on it, do you end up sort of gravitating towards them do you sort of find each other quite quite often in <laughs> in these things <laughs> Um, meet around the vegan options at the, at the stops and stuff <laughs> i don't know whether i do doing races like i guess i've met just as many vegans as uh, as non-vegans doing them there was a funny um moment i was in borneo for um like a, a trail camp and then we did the borneo ultra trail at the end of it a couple of years ago um and i think we were like a group of 10 and four out of 10 of us were vegan um and so Every time, like after a run or something, or if we were just out for the day doing something, like every time we went to some kind of like food market, like, right, vegans, assemble, let's find the <laughs> vegan options. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know, we were talking about this with a few friends, I don't know what it is, whether it's because like you're in nature a lot and that lends itself to being more, I, I have no idea why it is or I think a lot of people started like testing veganism because they saw um oh, what's that documentary i'm thinking of uh game changers and things like this like i think certain people like within sports like started to test that kind of diet as well um that comes up every time i say that i run and i'm vegan somebody's like have you seen this <laughs> um but yeah i i i don't know why it is that there's there's so many it might be like I do think there's a performance element in it. It's like, I think there's a lot of really good vegan ultra runners and I not myself not included in being the, ve the really good ones. But um, like, I think there's something to be said for like recovery time and stuff. There's a lot of, there's a lot of research around kind of like how less inflammation helps you recover quicker after what you've been doing. Um, and so, yeah, there was a race I ran in Egypt a little while ago and I think, I think all of the winners were all vegan, which is just really like, yeah, I mean, the sample size are very small, but like, I like to think there's something in that. It's really interesting though. Like your, when your little stat there where you had like four and 10 in that particular group, you yeah. know, when you think 1% of the population are vegan and in that particular group, you had a 40% vegan really rate. That's yeah. quite amazing, isn't it really? And then for a bunch of us to be running in a desert in Egypt and there's at least three or four vegans in that, like it's, um, yeah, it's unusual, but I come across lots of fellow There's something going on there. Vegans. It, and it can't, it can't all be rich roll and... Okay. <laughs> maybe it is <laughs> maybe it's all rich roles <laughs> influence i don't know but <laughs> it was it that what was the book he wrote is it finding ultra or something yeah 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 i, I mean because i have had like folks who who I've, I've spoken to are into into long distance running um and if i've ever you know veganism has come up they that they say, "Oh, Rich Roll, have you have you read his book?" You know, so it, it's clearly like registered with some of those people in that yeah. in that world, and 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 obviously game changers as well. That's definitely like. Do do you think there's a, you know, in in the sort of the 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 vegan world generally, if our if our aim is to essentially get more people to uh, see the this way of living as the way to go and ultimately harm less animals and so on. Do, do you think there is a bit of a, well, there, there is more marketing to do around that particular culture, around the health and the fitness? Obviously, we talked about earlier briefly that there's this this kind of backlash that we've seen around the word ultra-processed 
being thrown at, at veganism and, and quite purposefully from what I understand from folks close to the the uh, the industry that's quite a targeted and deliberate campaign mm. using the word ultra processed do you think that there's there's a lot more to do in that space in the sort of health fitness world to get people to associate veganism with good health benefits yeah i think there should be i think i mean i think it's like an obvious angle to to get people more on board like the amount of people I've kind of encountered who have said that because of watching something like Game Changers, they tested cutting out meat and things. I think, I mean, essentially most people want want to do things that are healthy for them. So if, I mean, and there's so much research and there's, there's so many facts around plant-based or, you know, cutting out the majority of animal products being better for you that I just, I think it should be marketed more that way. Um, I think, like, unfortunately, you're always going to have people that are going to say, no, I eat real food or I eat this or that. And um, and I think it's, because I, I, I think with the sort of the veganism argument, I think the problem tends to be that people go, yeah, it would be good not to harm animals, but nobody else is going to do that. So why should I kind of thing? Whereas I think if it directly benefits you, and your health and like if you're into sport your performance I think it's a much more personal thing that you can kind of take control of something um so I do think it's a it's yeah it would be a good thing to link to more and more um I mean you're always going to have people that are going to bring back the ultra process and things like this because I just think it's it's something that's like you say is quite purposefully trying to be associated I think with uh, veganism at the moment but um, yeah, I definitely think there's there's room for more education as well around like what do normal vegans eat because we're like not everybody is is eating like ultra processed things all the time. Um, and I don't know about you, but when somebody finds out I'm vegan, often they're like, "What do you eat?" Which is one of those bizarre questions, you know, when everything pops out of your head as well. When somebody says, "What music do you listen to?" and you can't think of a single band for ten minutes. I always have that as well. I'm like, what do I eat? Um, because it's true, like the majority of the time, you usually eat something fairly healthy. You might have a vegan burger now and again or something, but it's very much like, yeah, it's not intrinsic to what your diet is. So I think generally any like education around actually, like this is a normal vegan diet and you eat X, Y, and Z. But I think, I also think the kind of problem stems from like, school system and the way we've been like taught to think about like the different food groups and things you grow up being told healthy is having x amount of meat x amount of milk get your calcium get this and that and so I think trying to establish it as something that like overwrites that as being more healthy is hugely challenging because it's just so inbred in people to to think that on that note do you you think like the the world of the my fitness pals and the kind of the the macro driven um diet that sort of people been pushed to through that kind of world has also if you like um created a, a sense that food is three types of thing that there that it stopped people worrying about micronutrients and people are now thinking about you know protein carbs and fat and at, mm. at, at all costs and therefore it's very easy to simplify your plate into those are my three things and meat is my protein and so on. And do you think that's had a, it's almost a bit of a detrimental effect on kind of, I mean, when I say culture, I'm, you know, obviously talking about the microcosm of Western culture that use things like my fitness pal and a, you know, diet culture obsessed, but do you think that's had a, had a negative impact on people's view of what true, going back to our original point about what true real food is. Yeah, yeah. No, I think so. I mean, it's because it, it's like oversimplifying. But I also, I mean, I think this comes from like kind of like 80s and 90s diet culture as well, where we're just taught that fat is bad, carbs are bad. <laughs> um, and it, nobody goes no, not nobody but a lot of people don't if you're using something like my fitness pal let's say you maybe don't go any further than thinking well that's a carb so I better not eat it because I, I want to focus more on protein because I want to lose weight 
Whereas actually, I mean, your body needs carbs, like especially if you're going to work out or run or something, you have to have carbs. But what kind of carb you eat can be completely different. Um, yeah, I think like the same, like a okay, case so that we want protein and we want carbs and we want fats, but then like what kind of vegetables do you want to eat? Because like, do you need magnesium? Do you need this? Do you like, but it's, my partner says all the time, like it's not something you really get taught at school it's not something that even comes up at doctors really it's just something that you kind of either know or you don't and it's super easy to simplify it by going all right I want to lose weight so I'm cutting out all my carbs or I'm not going to eat any fats um and yeah it's just I think it's very detrimental to people's like overall diets yeah t- totally totally and it, you, you're so right you mentioned the, the, the point about doctors I've had a been lucky enough to have a few really good conversations with um, some of the folks at um, uh, vegan health uh, professionals, uh, Shireen Kazam and and so on, uh, who are doing great work in that space about um, educating healthcare professionals in in mm-hmm. kind of how to talk about these things. And um, uh, I, th- I think there's there's some really good work being done there, but it's yeah, there's so much more to do. Like and like you say, schools is really fascinating. I, you know, I've got a little boy who's six, um, and is you know obviously deep in the, the kind of primary state primary education system, and um, the sort of very fairly casual cementing of you know straight down the line ideals of like dairy is calcium. Yeah. Uh, he, he came home with a piece of paper a while back that was like a little bit of work that they'd had to do with kind of food groups and lines that they had to to put towards the, the food mm-hmm. groups. And, you know, the calcium had the bottle of milk, the dairy bottle of milk. And, yeah, you know, yeah. the protein had the meat thing. And, it you know, it was... And that was, that was all he's going to get at this age. He's, he's quite young, but... It, it it was interesting and obviously sparks uh that sort of thing sparks conversation with teachers and so on but you know yeah. they're, they're just teaching what's in the curriculum and you know they haven't thought about it <laughs> yeah, themselves and yeah yeah the dairy equaling calcium thing i i think it's i think that's so interesting because like so much of it is marketing as well it's, Obviously, like stuff like marketing is what I do for a living, so I find I find that super interesting. But like a lot of it, especially in the US, when you watch things around that, it's like yeah, that's cemented into you so that you'll buy more milk. And like, at no point is somebody telling you to eat spinach for calcium, but then you're like, but you know, greens have it's yeah, it's fascinating to me like how much of what we learn is from marketing spiel, really. Yeah. My mum said to me something the other day. I mean, my mum is um, now suffering with osteoporosis um, and she's drunk milk and had dairy like her entire life. Um, And only recently in actually kind of researching it and things, she's like, well, actually, no, I should be eating like more leafy greens. I need to make sure I'm getting vitamin K. I need to make sure things are being absorbed. Um, Similar to the episode that you had the other day about how like bioavailable are things to you there are things that contain calcium maybe, but your body can't absorb as well as it would from another kind of food. So yeah, I find stuff like that absolutely fascinating, but it's, it's true. Like, I think it's so simplified from, from when we go to school, right through to kind of what we get from the doctors, what's told, like then what's told to us in marketing. Um, And one one of the biggest things is like, you know, like fortified things at the supermarket, like bread that has a random vitamin in it or something. Like that's not where you should be getting a vitamin D from. (laughs) no 100% there's so many of those things and they are pure pure marketing yeah. you know, I've talked about many times on this show about um this Mars bar that I've come across in various like service stations that's uh like marketed with the word protein written on it in oh things letters. that put the word protein on them to make them sound healthy drive me insane yeah yeah I, I bet I so I imagine like the 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 running world is full of those things that have got protein written on the front of them, trying to yeah. target people, probably not people who are as serious as yourself, but probably the people who are like me who are kind of a bit casual and are like, oh, okay, well that says protein. So that's probably good. Right. And it's essentially yeah, a chocolate bar. Like, you see, like, I think I saw like protein ice cream in the supermarket today. I'm like, it's not like, what is this? And it's okay. So it has protein in it. 
but does that make it good for you? Like I stand by like if it if it tastes like a chocolate bar and it says protein, it's probably still a chocolate bar. Like that's totally fine. Just have the regular chocolate bar. Yeah, don't pretend to yourself that it's, it's anything other than it's a chocolate bar. Yeah, but yeah, we whack the word protein on things now, and apparently that's supposed to make it. Uh, yeah, that's supposed to make it healthier. Yeah, it feels like there should be some sort of regulation on um, on truth in marketing when it comes to nutrition. Like, there's too much at stake to just allow market forces yeah. to to allow those things to happen. Yeah, it is interesting that you can just whack a word like that on it, and it'll make it yeah more appealing to everybody. And it's super misleading, even if what they're saying is true, it does have more protein in it, perhaps, but it also has 17 times the sugar content. Or something. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, even the word vegan, you know, is not is not regulated in the in the UK. So, you know, there's been various cases where it's actually been like bars, cereal bars, I think it was, that had honey in them and the word vegan written all over it. And then there was a whole big debate about that. And um, but but there's no re- legislation, so they're not technically they weren't doing anything illegal. So it was just their definition that. of vegan, which is bonkers to me. But yeah. you know. One one day, one day we'll get there. The, the good folks at the Vegan Society and so on are doing doing some great work in that space. Um, yeah. I've got one final question for you. If if um, if you've just finished a hundred mile race, what what do you eat? What's the meal that's the hand breaks off? You can you can eat whatever you like. Um, it's a funny thing because the thing you dream of when you're running a hundred miles when you finish, you don't feel like at all (laughs) you can dream of a pizza for 100 miles and when you finish like I just want a piece of fruit or something um what did I eat I was very lazy after this 100 miler I think I was I finished it in France so I I had a nap I had a lie down I had a half a beer and then kind of like fell asleep into the beer (laughs) Um, and then, yeah, later on, I made myself a bit of pasta. I got a really fresh, hot baguette from the boulangerie, which was, that went down a treat. Um, yeah, I think I had some tofu. Yeah, I popped out that night. There was a Japanese place. So I had like kind of like a rice bowl with tofu with veg and nice, stuff. And that was, nice. You also feel like that's what you should have. Mm. Like going back to like the carbs, protein thing, you're like, right a good amount of rice it has vegetables it has tofu for protein and so that felt like a a good substantial thing to eat but in reality your stomach well at least mine anyway your stomach doesn't feel right (laughs) for a little while after because you've been throwing so many energy things in you've been up all night so um yeah the reality is you think right when I finish this is my meal and then you finish and you either can't be bothered to go get that meal or (laughs) somebody just hands you a beer and you're like okay well this will do that'll do yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Meg it's been great chatting with you and I must say like what an inspiration to folks like eight years did you say since you started running yeah roughly I think yeah yeah six six years being vegan like the the, the journey's amazing really to have gone from <laughs> I, I wonder if I could do what that person's doing on his treadmill to 100 <laughs> miles, like true inspiration. And, and thank you so much for your time because I know you're super, super busy either running or working or traveling. So um, thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much. It was good, good to chat about my veganism. <laughs> 